Phoenix police officers were coming down the ramp to really kind of deal with what was going on inside. And I'll, I'll never forget, one of, the, uh, one of the officers came up to me and said, okay, where are they? And I said, follow me. And we walked into the dressing rooms and, you know, he said, that's Tommy and that's Nikki. And, and they put the cuffs on them and took them into our jail cells that we have at the arena. Those were certainly our most famous uh, residents in the jail cells and, and they were arrested. Hey everyone, I'm Lindsay Smith and welcome to The Outlet, a Phoenix Suns podcast. Today our guest is General Manager of the Arena, Ralph Marchetta. Ralph, thank you so much for hanging out with us. So I know I introduced you as the General Manager of the Arena, but your job is so much more than that. So break <laughs> it down for us, kind of give us some insight into what your job entails. Sure, so as, as General Manager of the Arena, I am uh, really responsible for the overall physical plant, the building, you know. Uh, in addition to that, all the events that happen at the arena, whether it's Phoenix Suns games or concerts. So really all of the elements that go into making those things happen, whether it's the ticket office, uh, our event staff, traffic support, security, um, you know, the, the, the ticketing system, all of those things really fall under my area of responsibility. So I heard that you started out with a blowtorch, <laughs> filling in the asphalt in the parking lot at the Coliseum. I did, <laughs> Tell yeah. me about your path and your journey yeah. in this career and so, kind of how you got to where you are today. So I did. I actually, my first summer out of high school, I started working at Veterans Memorial Coliseum, which is the old arena where the Suns played. And, and ho you know, the, the Coliseum hosted all the concerts in town at the time. And I, I graduated from high school and I needed a summer job. And I um, started working in the parking lot with a propane torch and a jackhammer in June, July, and August, jackhammering the asphalt, blow, blow torching, burning out diesel spots, and, and black topping. Um, and that fall, I went to Arizona State University and I continued to work at the Coliseum. And I did literally every job there was to do. I worked in security. I sold concert t-shirts, best job ever. I, uh, I was a beer vendor. I pushed a broom. I drove a forklift. Uh, I was an usher. I, I literally did just about every job there is to do. And, you know, I, I loved music and I loved sports. And I knew I wasn't a musician and I knew I wasn't an athlete. And I'm like, okay, there has to be, there has to be a thing here, right? There has to be a, a career here. And in those days, they didn't have these sports business programs like pretty much every university in the country does now. There really wasn't, none of that existed. So I kind of created my own, give myself a little too much credit, but kind of created my own program. And when I graduated from Arizona State University, I started working at the Coliseum full time as an assistant event coordinator and then event coordinator. And then in 92, when this building opened, I made the move downtown with the Suns. And I was a, the event coordinator until 96. And then I got into the booking side of things, which I've always loved and been passionate about. And about 12 years ago, I became general manager. So it's my dream job. It's my dream career. Um, you know, I've just been incredibly fortunate to have uh, great mentors, great bosses, great co-workers along the way. Absolutely. I mean, that sounds like such a wild ride, but it's really cool to see kind of how your career has evolved with the sports and entertainment space as well, which is kind of neat. So I want to get into that a little bit because you said you, you came downtown with the Suns in 92. How has basketball and the concert business evolved in the last s few decades? Wow, you know, really dramatically. I mean, you know, when I started in the 80s, the concert business in particular was still really the Wild West in, in every possible way. 
And now it is, it is a business, it is, it is a much more, um, you know, kind of serious thing. It's a corporate thing now in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and on the sports side, you know, a basketball game was very basic. You know, there wasn't the amazing game entertainment that we have now. There, there weren't, um, you know, you didn't have uh, the lights and the effects and the music. And it just, it was just a completely different thing. And it's really exciting. And especially now in the context of what is happening with our arena and all of the technology and the video and the capability, it's, it's pretty amazing to see it from when I started to where we've evolved to. Fans, did you know only 20 to 30% of students who are bullied tell adults or authorities? That leaves the vast majority of children to believe that they have no one to turn to and are left to suffer alone. We don't want our children to feel this way. If you want more information on how to talk to kids about bullying, how to help them through bullying, and how to stop bullying, visit muststopbullying.org. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how it's evolving even more, especially from the arena side. So one of the things that I've heard over the last couple years that I've been a part of the Suns organization is that these shows come in and they're not just, you know, a concert. It's a legitimate show. They've got things hanging from yeah. the ceiling. They've got like full blown structures that you're moving in. So how does Project 201 and the renovation of the arena help make that even bigger and better? Sure. So I guess, you know, by way of an example, um, a big concert in 1992, you know, would be 100,000 pounds. And, you know, that was like, wow. Well, basically, you know, we're now at the point where we're doubling that. And a big concert in 1992, you know, might have been 10 semis. Well, anymore, that, that's 20 plus, 30 plus for an arena show. And, and that's staging, sound, lights, video. Uh, it's just, it is so much more complex and, and so much more technologically advanced now compared to 28 years ago. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Okay, tell me a little bit about what it's like to book a concert and get that act here to downtown Phoenix. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting process and we are in a competitive market. Uh, and one of the things that, that I say, you know, as opposed to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's not just, we're not just competing with Phoenix, we're competing with, you know, Copenhagen, right? I mean, any artist is going to do so many shows in a single year and so many shows in North America. Um, and it's become a completely global business and it's a competitive landscape for us. Sure, it's competitive here in town, um, but we're competing with every city in the world in, in, a really, in a real sense. So how much do relationships come into play when you're trying to convince somebody to pick this specific arena? Yeah, you know, I mean, Look, I, um, I still believe that, that relationships do matter and that, and that those relationships that evolve over the years are important. Um, you know, there's a trust factor with, um, with a promoter or with an agent or with a manager. Um, those things are really important, right? They want to know that their artist is going to be well taken care of, that you know, things are going to go well and that they know that if there's an issue, you are gonna be there to deal with it and take care of it. So yeah, I, I still think that's important. Not, not that money isn't a big factor, um, but I think they still count. I, I mean, I would like to think so too, yeah. right? Like if yeah. you've been there once, you know kind of who you're working with and right. how things are run. So I think it would play in a little bit. Yep. Um, and it can't help or it can't hurt that you've been in the business for like 40 some odd years. <laughs> Did I get that number about right? Feels like it, <laughs> pretty, pretty close. Somewhere around there. Uh, okay, so 
We've gotten sports back to a degree, yeah. um, but there is no equivalent of watching your favorite team on TV in the concert world. Nothing yeah. replaces that traditional in-person concert experience. So when concerts do come back, what do you think it's going to be like? How do you think that industry will navigate post-COVID? Yeah, and you know, it, we have been, we honestly, from uh, almost day one with, with the current, you know, pandemic, we've been working really hard to figure out what that's gonna look like. And, you know, there are still parts of it that I think we're going to have to, um, you know, work through. But I am, I, I am so excited about the day when we can welcome fans back to the arena because I know the artists are excited, you know, the, the fans are excited, and we'll get there. And, and we're working really hard to create a safe environment. We're looking at technology. We're looking at you know, science, we're looking at all of the things that it's going to take to create a safe environment for the artists and the fans. It's going to happen, and, and I can't wait. And it's, when it does, I think um, people are going to be so excited to be back together again. Absolutely. I can only imagine how much everybody is looking forward to being back in a building with all of their favorite friends yeah. and artists as well. Um, I just want to follow up a little bit more because Obviously, after 9-11 happened, the sports world, the entertainment concert world had to kind of adjust mm -hmm. um, the way that business was run, the way that concerts were held and hosted. How do you think that translates now in the COVID kind of situation in terms of adapting? Yeah, you know, very similar situations um, in, in that we did have to adapt, adapt and we did have to make changes to, to certain things. And this will be no different. You know, we will, we will make changes and, and we will um, adopt technology, adopt protocols, um, look at everything that we do from top to bottom, look at that guest journey from the moment they buy that ticket, park that car, walk, every step along the way and, and how can we make that safer in light, of, in light of the pandemic and the current situation? So I think it's a very, it's a really, it's a good analogy because, you know, 9-11 was a, a really traumatic event. Um, and, and this is likewise a very traumatic event, but um, the, live, the live sports and entertainment industry has recovered, will recover, and, and in a bigger and better way. If you've ever asked yourself, what exactly is bullying? Well, bullying is repeated, unwanted, hurtful behavior where a person or group is stronger or holds some sort of power over the person being bullied. This behavior is physical, psychological, social, or educational and inflicts harm or distress on the target. If you would like to get information on how you can recognize bullying and how you can help prevent bullying, head to muststopbullying.org. So you are so heavily involved in Project 201 and the transformation of the arena. What is going to be your favorite part <laughs> of the new reimagined uh, arena? Wow. Okay, that is the hardest question. Um, you know, it, it's funny, as I thought about it, um, one of the reasons I think that we're using the word transformation versus renovation is because renovation to me kind of has a connotation that oh, we're slapping a fresh coat of paint on it and you know it's all good. Um, transformation is definitely a more appropriate word um, because I can't think of a surface in this building, a space in this building that isn't going to be touched and, and altered and improved in some way. Uh, but back to your question, uh, I, it's really hard, but I honestly, I think it's that walking into the pavilion, seeing that space open to the bowl, to the scoreboard, and, and the video on, on either side, the renderings are great, but they don't do it justice. That to me is going to be the most 
um, spectacular uh, feature. But there are a lot of spectacular features, but that to me is like, that's gonna be the best. All right, what's your two and three? So number two, uh, without a doubt, are the corner bars. Okay. And I think when uh, fans get to, again, you're gonna walk into that pavilion and be blown away and, and in awe. And, and right after that, you're gonna walk in and see a, a bar in the corner of the arena, open to the arena bowl. That's gonna be a really unique, uh, I think, setting for people and for fans. And I think they're gonna be really excited about that. So that's number two. Number three, I would have to say, is gonna be the scoreboard. Yes. Because when you see the difference in size and clarity, and it's like, it's shocking. And I think that is, that's a close three. You know, it's two and three, they're really gonna be close in my opinion. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that new video board as well. Yeah. I just kind of think that, I mean, everything else is going to be drastically changed, but that's the one that you see, I think, the most, yeah. just because it's right there in the center, and that's yep. what you always look to, when whether it's a highlight yeah. or um, additional content for a concert, uh, yeah. things like that. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. But I like your point of, um, the openness when you walk in because right now I kind of feel like you walk in and you're like okay we're here then we're gonna go around here and then it's like okay now we're here yeah but when you walk in the doors you're gonna be like that's it we're here shows getting started games about to start and then now it's like the whole night has begun and I think and I think you know I think fans are gonna notice that the concourses are wider that there's more space. The softer seats. Softer seats. Those will be a game changer. I mean, there, <laughs> it's, it's such a long list and it's really hard to rank them, you know, and the food hall, as I think about what that's gonna look like, um, the club spaces, I mean, it's just, it's a, like I said, it's a long list and it's really hard to decide. Absolutely, okay. So the last thing I have for you, I want to know what is one of your favorite behind the scenes, backstage stories of your career? Wow. Um, Maybe two stories, because yeah. you probably have a lot. No, you know, I, um, I've, I've had some amazing experiences over the years. Um, one of the wildest experiences that that immediately kind of jumped to mind is a, a Motley Crue show that we had a few years back. And I'm trying to remember what year this was. It might have been 96, somewhere in there. So um, we had Motley Crue at the arena and it was, it was coming towards the end of the show and um, the band, um, I guess for all intents and purposes, kind of instigated a riot. And the comment from the stage was, chairs are for weddings and funerals. And chairs started to fly into a big pile on the floor. And fans started jumping on stage, ripping chairs out, seats out. And it, it really quickly, it started to get pretty scary. It got, it got really kind of out of control. And there must have been a couple hundred uh, fans on that stage. And, and it, was, it was pretty intense. And I'll never forget, um, Phoenix police officers were coming down the ramp to really kind of deal with what was going on inside. Um, I had never had an experience quite like that. Uh, so we were really trying to you know, maintain order the best that we could. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget one of the, uh, one of the officers, and, and it might have been a lieutenant at the time, came up to me and said, okay, where are they? And I said, follow me. And we walked into the dressing rooms and, you know, he said, that's Tommy and that's Nikki. And, and they put the cuffs on them and took them into our jail cells that we have at the arena. Um, those haven't been used a lot, but those were certainly our most famous uh, residents in the jail cells, and, and they were arrested. Um, and, you know, eventually we were able to, to restore order and, uh, you know, get the building emptied out, but not after uh, significant 
uh, significant damage. So that was a really long night. Um, and that was, uh, that was an experience I definitely will never forget. I bet, because <laughs> like, what even goes through your head in that moment of like, what do we even do here? Yeah, you know, it, it was, um, and again, being, being on the event side of things, um, you know, you're really, you're, you're you worst case scenario things a lot. And you're always kind of thinking through if this, then that, you know, and, and when that happened, um, we really came together well, I think, as a team. And, you know, you're, you're somewhat limited in terms of what you can control and what you can do uh, when it gets to that point. But I, I felt like we handled it, you know, all in all, I felt like we handled it really well. Yeah, for sure. That's crazy. That's such a fun story to have, like, in your back pocket. <laughs> it though. wasn't fun at the time. At the no, time, it like, was, you it know, was 20 years later. Yeah. 20 plus years <laughs> later, it's fun. Uh, that oh night, gosh. it was it was pretty uh pretty intense. I bet. Yeah. That's something that I feel like you'd probably will never forget. Yes. And that's no always doubt. a good party story. I think that you should pull out more no, often. No <laughs> doubt about it. No awesome. doubt. Awesome. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we had a good time getting to know you and we are so excited to see this brand new arena once it's all complete. Great. Great to see you today. Thank you for the opportunity. Can't wait for everyone to come, you know, be able to come back downtown, come to a Suns game come to a concert, we're, we're excited. Yes, okay, we'll see you guys next time.